welcome to episode one of the Let's Do a Crime podcast. My name is Ryan, he, him. My name is Mouse, they, them. I have been in law enforcement for three years and emergency services for about ten. I am not a police officer. Don't get don't get out of shape about that. <laughs> but if you saw me, you'd probably think I was a cop. And you're definitely a bastard. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I am. I am a type of bastard. Yes. And I'm an artist. <laughs> So this podcast is about crimes that I find interesting. It is not a murder co- podcast. This isn't a serial killer podcast. This is mostly things that I find interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean I won't talk about murders. This episode is going to have a murder in it, kind of manslaughter, depending on how, who's telling the story. Any trigger warnings I make, I'm going to put in the episode descriptions. Mm-hmm. That way, if, uh, if I forget something and need to go back and edit later, it's a lot easier to put it in the description than in the show itself. But if there's something major, like if there's yeah, you know, if there's anything major that is definitely going to be a trigger, I'll put it in the episode itself. Yeah. Okay. Mouse. Yes. Have you ever heard about Luibo Ludwig? I mean, vaguely because you've mentioned it in passing, but aside from the name, uh, no, not really. <laughs> yeah, we're we're going in circles here because I have talked about Luibo Ludwig, and because we knew we were doing this episode, Mouse didn't want to hear. And you found him. <laughs> so, we will love we, This is the story from our pro, pro home province of Alberta. Mm-hmm. The Texas we, of Canada. Yes. yes. So, great great for first episode because this has everything. It has maybe cults. It has eco-terrorism mm-hmm. or eco-activism, depending on who who's telling the story. It has police misconduct. It has maybe a murder. Right. Yeah. <laughs> depending on who tells the, the, it. Depending on who tells the story. Yeah. yeah. Does it have uh, political intrigue? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a connection it's, movie. It's definitely politically relevant to, to today. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Weibo is a very controversial figure. That's putting it lightly. Hmm. Uh, here are a couple of headlines around his death. Okay. Uh, anti-oil patch activist Weibo Ludwig has died. It's pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. And then another one. Oil patch bomber Weebo Ludwig, warrior to some, terrorist to others, dead at 70. Okay. <laughs> so this this gives you a, a, a hint into how this guy is perceived, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's somewhat difficult to find information about Weebo Ludwig. Uh, mm-hmm. this, most of these events happened in the early 2000s when the internet was just kind of just starting to become popular. Yeah. Not a whole lot of news websites have good archives from that time, so I really had to dig. And there's really not a whole lot about his early life before he came to Alberta. So all of the stuff from his early life is straight ripped from Wikipedia. I'll tell you that right now because I couldn't find anything else about it. Right. Uh, Ludwig was born in the Netherlands in December of 1941. His family emigrated to Canada sometime after World War II. Uh, he attended a Dort College to study to be a pastor for the Christian Reformed Church. So this is like one of those situations where this church actually requires you to get a degree, degree to be a pastor. Right. Uh, he led two churches in Goodrich, Ontario. Uh, the leadership was very divisive. Uh, he allegedly insisted on women being subservient to husbands, uh, was allegedly regarded as being very authoritarian and aggressive, mm-hmm. uh, seemed a very inflexible Old Testament kind of type of religious leader. Yeah, I mean, based on like the time period, hearing that he believed that women needed to be subservient doesn't really surprise me, because <laughs> like, that type of thinking was pretty... It was on the out, but it was still pretty common. Yeah. yeah. I found one anecdote from Hythe, which is the... Hythe is the town he lived in, in Alberta. Uh, a Hythe storekeeper that Ludwig's wife was once punished by having her head shaved and banished from the compound for a period of time. Oh, okay. So... so very Old Testament. Yeah, so not just like, like, oh, the wife should be at home. More like, oh, the wife deserves punish, uh, punishment. Yeah, so like abusive his, punishment. Excellent. Yeah, okay. He, he he moved to yeah. Oh, sorry, um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Despite mm. living a simple life, he seemed he did seem to relish being in the spotlight. He kind of always put himself in positions of de facto leadership where people would have to talk to him. Uh, he made some very inflammatory statements and was very publicly outspoken uh, in the early parts of his activism. And this is one thing about uh, Ludwig is that like you know some people think he's an activist, some people think he's a terrorist. Uh, porque lo nos dos is both like he was legitimately an activist for at least part of this uh, he moved to Hythe, Alberta in 1985 he purchased some farmland and built a compound with his large family 11 children 23 grandchildren according to Global News at the time of his death as well as two of his other friends and their family similar size so there's 
three families that become like his compound, his mm-hmm. his person, like he's the priest of this compound. Wait, so he built a compound or? Well, compound, like they're, they're using the term loosely here. It's, it's basically like they built their own community. That, like, okay. it was a private community. Okay, so is that where the cult part comes in, then? Yeah, so a lot of people accuse him of being a cult. Like, I think they kind of walked the line here, um, because they definitely have, like, some very cult ways of doing things, but they're also, like, they don't act like you would think a cult would. They they act more like an, like a Hutterite colony or a commune, even though okay. they're not. Okay. So, like, whether they're a cult or not really depends on who you talk to. Okay, so it's more along the lines of, like, they were a private community that created themselves, but depending on who you talk to. Yeah, he was definitely the leader, though. Him and okay. him and the other two men who brought their families. Um, one of the other men, Richard Boonstra, is also relevant to the story. He's mm. kind of involved in some of this stuff here. Was he a dick? I'm... I'm going to assume so, because they believe women should be subservient and have a fuckload of kids. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, makes but sense. As of, as of recording, so this is this is in October 2022, I haven't heard anything about, like, you know, big scandals involving this, this group. There hasn't been, like, you know, escapees and survivors, like, talking about. So it seems to be a little bit more on the, like, really obscure religion side than the cult side, but only time will tell. Okay. Um, besides the religious beliefs, the community he founded aimed for self-sustainability. Uh, by the 2000s, the, the compound grew its own vegetables, raised several kinds of livestock, had solar and wind power. And this is in the 2000s. That's, that's pretty yeah, that's ahead of the time. wild. Uh, especially given where we are. Yeah. Uh, Hythe, Alberta, where it is, it's pretty far north Alberta. It's mm-hmm. pretty near the border with BC, so it's it's not far from Dawson Creek, which is okay. because of the TV show. A lot of people know where Dawson Creek yes. is. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but it's pretty close there, but it's on the Alberta side. Okay. Uh, Ludwig himself said uh, that the commune was 80% fossil fuel free and self-sufficient food-wise. The children there were also homeschooled, which was a point mm, of contention. Yeah. <laughs> the local authorities tried really hard to prevent the homeschooling, but... There was no evidence of abuse. All the children were well fed. No, they weren't like doing. They didn't believe like crazy things that they could find. So it seems like the children were well taken care of. So the homeschooling continu- continues to this day, as far as I can tell. Oh, so they're still like out there. Oh yeah, they're still out there. Like like he died a few years ago, but like the commune is still thriving. Okay, and yeah. it's still just like these three families, or I think it's just these three joined? families. Like like it's primarily the three families that's the majority of them the families intermarried with each other obviously yeah i think there were some outsiders that intermarried in and and stuff like that well yeah because you'd get into some problems otherwise yeah keep in mind this is only founded in 1985 so we're only really like a generation or two away from the founding of it during the 90s and early 2000s ludwig became an activist against sour gas flaring and extraction during this time the number of sour gas wells increased quickly coincided with the number of miscarriages and birth defects amongst his community, mm-hmm. uh, again, which is largely his own family. Yeah. Uh, he lobbied local and provincial government to place harsher regulations on the oil companies. He was largely ignored by them. Uh, it should not be understated how important and powerful oil field is, especially in these northern areas of Alberta. Especially just in Alberta in general. Yeah, so there's a lot of incentive to not find problems with them, is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, um, I just think that for context for anybody listening, it's important to specify that where we live oil and gas is like the predominant driving force of our local economy so it's extremely big it's a big industry it controls a lot within alberta yeah and right now it's actually become more important again because of the currently the war in ukraine's going on and yeah the world trying to not be reliant on russian oil has become our oil and gas industry has become more important again which is unfortunate but yeah, it's, it's an it's an unavoidable circumstance. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like it's necessary, but the government really should be cracking down on these people more. The mm-hmm. uh, sour gas. So Alberta is known for oil and gas; it's the main export, just as Mouse just said. Mm-hmm. At the time, Ludwig founded his compound. There was only one sour gas well in the area, but in the eight line, not, late eighties and early nineties, there's a big boom of development, and ra- wells are rapidly going up all around him. Sour gas is natural gas, which contains H2S, hydrogen sulfide. So natural gas by itself is pretty safe. It's when it burns, it tends to burn cleanly. So that's why we use the heat our homes. We can use it on like stoves and stuff like that. But H2S, hydrogen sulfide, is a type of natural gas that is extremely poisonous. And so it has to be removed from the natural gas before it's before it's given to market, which is what flaring is. They burn it off. It's one of the only safe ways to deal with it okay 
Uh, do you know anything about H2S? Uh, no. <laughs> no, uh, I came from a uh, an oil and gas family, but I think they worked in just like crude oil. So I don't know too much about like the gas part of that industry. Yeah. Crude oil will usually have H2S in it too, but not uh, as much. Well, then you know what? When they were talking, I was listening. <laughs> It's not as dangerous in crude oil because it's not as much. Like if, yeah, if you smell H two S in small amounts, you'll smell. You can smell. It smells like rotten eggs, like really bad. Oh, like sulfur. Yeah. Mm, okay. But H two S is such a poisonous gas that in higher concentrations, it can actually like disable your olfactory nerve, and you won't be able to smell anything. Oh, that's. Which, and of course, safe. that's in the concentrations where it starts like killing you. Yeah. Uh, H2S must be removed before the gas is usable, which is called sweetening. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's pumped to another facility while it's still sour. Wait, it's... Okay. Yeah. Why are they using food terms? Oh, that... So this is a little tangent. In the oil industry, like, sweet crude is, like, the really good crude, and, like, sour crude is has sour gas in it. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because back when they first started finding oil, they would taste it, and... Oh, my God. And light crude tastes sweet. In fact, it's actually where saccharin is extracted from. Like, saccharin a sweetener is extracted from oil. Yeah. But that's that's why it's called sweet or sour. Because literally, people... At, I hope no one tastes it now. Yeah, me but too. There, there was a period of time where people would rate the quality of, of the oil they extracted by how it tasted. Oh, you know what? Okay. But, I get historical ignorance. You have to do something to measure these things, but... From a modern standpoint, that's gross. <laughs> yeah. There's three ways to sweeten crude. One is to pump it to another facility while it's still sour, and it can be, like, chemically treated. Mm -hmm. One is to flare it. And flaring is pretty common, is even as a safety thing, because the pressure gets too high, they have to get the pressure down. Easiest way is to flare it. If you burn it with enough oxygen, it will burn into, like, normal carbon dioxide and, like, water vapor and some sulfur gas. Okay. which is much safer than the H2S itself. So if it's flared properly, it should be safe. Flaring actually happens pretty close to where I live, and it hasn't been a problem. But if it's not flared properly, you can actually get hydrogen sulfide in the air that you breathe. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's, it's extracted from the oil and gas and pumped back into the ground and sequestered. Problems that too. People accuse of poisoning groundwater. Mm -hmm. I think it poisons groundwater. It's not conclusively proven. I think the oil field has a lot to do with why it's not conclusively proven. But the <laughs> places that do this almost always have contaminated groundwater, so you've got you like know. Your, your, this is your tinfoil this, this, hat this, this moment. This is my tin, tinfoil hat <laughs> moment. Yeah. I mean, I I fully I just learned about this right this second, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Well, hydrogen sulfide is nasty stuff. It's it's toxic. It's corrosive. It's acidic. Yeah. It can kill your sense of smell. Mm -hmm. It's heavier than air and will build up in low sp spots. I've taken H2S safety training from the many of careers I have worked. Yeah. And it's just, this shit's just scary. Like, they, our safety training had multiple reports of, like, what happened when people were exposed to H2S gas to tell us not to fuck around with it. Where it's like, it's like worker A goes into confined space and goes unconscious. Worker B sees this and goes and grabs his feet and tries to drag him out and goes unconscious. Oh, worker sorry. C tries to rescue worker A and B and then they all die. Yeah. So... Uh, it's it's drilled into you if you're working with H2S. Like, if you suspect there's H2S in the air and someone has collapsed, you leave, you go get a respirator or the proper people to do this rescue and come back because yeah. you will be dead in minutes. And probably that guy's going to die too. But, like, it, yeah, H2S is nasty stuff. So, yeah, obviously there are, are problems with this being in the air around where your children are and yeah, stuff. Yeah, suddenly it makes a lot of sense why why he cared so much about this. So regardless of whether or not like the H2S was causing the defects and stuff like that in his community, it's pretty logical why you would think that. Yeah. Right? So, and in all through the 90s, uh, oil companies, mostly AEC, the Alberta Energy Corp, began experiencing acts of sabotage. So over 160 acts were recorded of various size. Most of them were bombings. There were other kinds of sabotage, like they would fill... Or encase wells in concrete, roads were blocked with abandoned vehicles and spike strips. Between their activism and a specific incident where they blocked a road, so the family blocked a road near the near property. Uh -huh. The Ludwig family was always on the police radar for this. Mm -hmm. So they were like, when they started going up, these defects are happening. Families outspoken right away and started doing things like 
like minor protests like blocking oil sites. And there's a few cases of them arguing with oil field workers and stuff like that. Which I'm sure did a lot. Yeah. There's actually one case which like I could only find this in anecdotal evidence from like first hand accounts, not mm-hmm. from any news reports, so I don't know how true it is. But apparently, like, after some of the bombing things happened and some of the court cases that happened and stuff like that, there's security guards posted at a lot of these places. Yeah. And some of the members of the Ludwig family went to one of the security guards, started, like, chatting him up, giving him coffee, hanging out with him. And while he was distracted, an oil field was, an oil site was bombed somewhere else. Oh. So this is, this is anecdotal. I don't know if this actually happened, mm-hmm. but it did, it did seem like the family was involved in it, not just Weibo. Uh, AEC offered $450,000 for the Ludwig property. Keep in mind, this is still the 90s. Yeah. Uh, Ludwig asked for $1.5 million. They eventually settled on $800,000, uh, but Ludwig backed out after a clause was attached requiring him and his family to leave Alberta. So <laughs> so clearly what Ludwig was probably thinking is, is, if I ask for enough money, I can just move my family and set up someplace else. Yeah, exactly. And the government was like, we know that you want to set up someplace else. Well, it's not, it's, it wasn't the go- this else. wasn't the government. This is AEC, which is, one, oh, of, which okay. is one of the oil companies. So yeah. they were trying to buy his land and they did negotiate a price, but then they threw in a clause saying, you have to leave Alberta. Uh-huh. I think because they knew he was just going to move someplace else mm-hmm. and pretty much all of Alberta has oil under it. Yeah. So they were trying to avoid this happening again. The In the later court cases, the prosecutors put forward the theory that Ludwig was trying to use terrorism to drive up the asking price on his property. My opinion, I don't think he wanted to sell it. He probably only considered it because of the oil, gas, and wells. Mm-hmm. And also, why would terrorism make his property more valuable? If anything, it makes it less valuable. Well, <laughs> Because oh. if, if he maintains he's not doing it, yeah, then that means someone else is doing it and we're just going to continue. Yeah, well, also, um, if they're like a self-sustained community, like why would they... Why would they do that? Why would they risk, like, damaging the livelihood that they've worked so hard to, like, set up to remove themselves from everybody else? Yeah, so I think this was grasping at straws. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to say right now, I'm pretty sure Ludwig was involved with most of these bombings, but I don't think it was related to the property value. I think it was just actually him thinking that they were wronging him. And I think that this 800000 settlement, he legit probably would have left the area. Uh, shortly after the deal fell through, two more wells were bombed. Around this time, he also publicly blamed the oil companies for killing his children. I didn't put this statement in. He, he made a long media statement about like how you can't just roll over and let them kill your children. You have to take action. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's it, very common rhetoric here, yeah, so it doesn't surprise me. Very close, uh, very close to a manifesto. Yeah. So, obviously, he became the prime suspect pretty quickly. Right? Wait, wait, back up for a sec. Were his kids dying? Well, he he started these this activism after some of the his kids were like not his kids, but his grandchildren were born either stillborn or deformed or there were miscarriages. Right, that part I understood. I just I I thought that like he meant like his his children who were alive well, I think at he, the time. I think he's using children more as like the global children. Like, oh, okay, like, yes, of like, course. So the like his grandchildren are still his child and in, in yeah. the well, it's a child that is part of his family kind yeah. of thing. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, he initially was charged in 1998 of one act of sabotage. Initial char- additional charges in February 2000 with 18 more charges were from the result of an RCMP investigation. Most of these uh, charges were the result of possessing or attempting to obtain explosives, advising an undercover police informant to purchase explosives, as well as uh, he and as well as friend Richard Boonstra were convicted. His friend who? Richard Boonstra, which is one of the people who he set up the commune with. Right, yes, okay. Yeah. And so there, there's a third man who also set up, but I didn't put his name in here because as far as I can tell, he was never implicated in anything. So okay. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. yeah. He was sentenced to 28 months in prison, which... I'll note is important because in Canada, if you're sentenced to more than two years in prison, so 24 months, then you have to be in a federal prison. So he was specifically sentenced like that, so he became a federal prison thing. If you're below that, you're in a provincial prison. If there are people from America listening, that might be a little bit weird. We have a kind of different system Mm -hmm. here, but like the general rule is under two years, provincial prison, over two years, federal prison. Uh, Boonstra was uh, sentenced for... I didn't see what he was sentenced for. He was, But Boonstra only served 21 days, and Weibo ended up serving 19 months. So not quite his whole sentence, but over a year. Okay. 
Yeah. And this was just over being, like, suspected. No, this this was a conviction, like, because the found evidence that he was trying to purchase explosives, and he advi- advised an undercover informant to purchase explosives for the purpose. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it should be noted there were smaller related convictions for mischief on the Ligus family, notably one of his sons. Previous to that, nothing to the scale. So, like, in the past, there have been a few little convictions. Like, one of his sons got caught on CCTV, like, cutting some valves on, on oil field property. Uh, but those are, like, mischief convictions, so they... <laughs> They didn't weren't like much at all. Just a fun little prank, cutting some valves on an oil field that you don't know what they do. Yeah. So this is where we we, we roll back a little bit to the investigation that just happened that got Ludwig convicted. Okay, because yeah, I'm like, we jumped. Did I miss something? No, no, no. I I talked about how we got convicted. Yeah. But I'm kind of putting this in order of how it was in the media. Mm-hmm. This is basically like this is people out there oil bombings. Guy gets convicted. And then how the investigation happened started coming up to the media. And this created a major media shitstorm. Oh, is this a Mr. Big? No, this is oh, this is not it. a Mr. Big. Damn it. This is this is a Dirty Tricks campaign. Okay. And Dirty Tricks is, is a is a thing that the media called it. It wasn't what the RCMP called it, but mm-hmm. like it's very appropriate. So during the hearings, Ludwig's lawyer presented evidence that the RCMP had caused one of the explosions themselves as part of the undercover operation. The Crown did not dispute this. So the Crown in, in Canadian court cases means the government. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Crown did not dispute this. And not long after, details of the RCMP operation, uh, which was called the Dirty Campaign by the media, began to come out. The police called it uh, Op- Operation Cabriolet, and it was directly involved with AEC, the company that they were dealing with. I'm sorry, could you please repeat the name of the operation? Operation Cabriolet. RCMP, in collaboration with AEC, so AEC was part of this campaign. Mm -hmm. They they were active in the investigation and the sting operation, which, eh, there's some problems with that. Yeah. The RCMP, in collaboration with AEC, blew up a shed covering a closed wellhead. They probably did this to give their informant more credibility because they they were getting an informant close to Ludwig at this time. Initially, they wanted to blow up a truck, which I will note would be a significant escalation over everything that's happened so far. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, all the sab- sabotage has happened so far has been against infrastructure and stuff like that. Like, like ne- nothing that, like, people would potentially be injured by. Yeah, I was just going to say, it doesn't really sound like they're trying to hurt people so much as they are trying to prevent the operation from continuing. Yeah, so, yeah, it looks like they haven't been trying to hurt anyone. They've mostly been going to the sites when they're not, no one's there and, and bombing them. Yeah. So, blowing up a truck would be, like, a significant escalation if... It was, like, the, the bomber doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, AEC backed out of the truck thing, saying that they were concerned that such an escalation would make their drivers afraid to work in the area. Uh, which, yeah, understandable. Yeah, like, everyone knew that the bombings were happening, but no one was afraid to go to work at this point because, yeah. like, no one had been targeted yet. If they start blowing up trucks or they think they're going to start blowing up trucks, then, of course, workers going to be like, I ain't delivering there. What the hell? Yeah, because you never know. Like, what if the truck that you're driving has a planted explosive, of course people wouldn't want to work after that. Yeah, so they blew up a shed instead, which, like, better choice, still probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> the operation involved a police informant who got close to the Ludwig and Boonstra and built evidence linking them to the sabotage, which is where the police got all the evidence that actually linked them to the previous acts. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, AEC held several town hall meetings regarding the sabotage even flying out a terrorist expert who drummed up uh, fear amongst the locals. So the bombing happened on October 14th, 1999. The town halls happened a week later with this expert talking about how, like, terrorists were coming and, like, were, were here to, like, destabilize Canada and stuff like that. Okay, so they believed that it was outside forces and not people within the province or yeah. anything like that. Well, well, or a local person who had already well, told well, no, this, to the, stop. These town halls were hosted by AEC, who knew this operation was happening. Yeah, but then why'd they bring in some, some person from the outside being, the, like, terrorists? I, I think that they were coordinated to maximize the emotional impact. So that when the ah. bombing happened and, like, the, the investigation, people would be, like, rallied mm-hmm. against, against so it Ludwig. So it was fear-mongering again, but for a different reason. Yeah, it was what we today call a PSYOP. Okay. They, they were making... And, the townspeople in the area were already, like, people didn't really like the Ludwigs. They kind of tolerated them because they didn't really fuck with them and they were good trade partners and stuff like that. But they, people were very weirded out by this family and, uh, and this yeah, compound. Yeah, of course. They're fucking weirdos that went and made their own compound and do 
dumb religious stuff in the middle of fucking nowhere. And one thing I should note is that, like, this this was already, like, a very... Even though, like, everyone suspected Ludwig of it, it wasn't clear-cut because, at the time, the area is mostly filled with either farmers or oil field workers. Mm-hmm. Most farmers did not like the oil field being here, and a lot the sentiment that the oil field was causing problems like, like sick livestock and miscarriages... It was a common sentiment, and it still is today. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just Ludwig and his, his band that were pushing this. So it wasn't super clear that it was definitely him, even though like everyone kind of suspected him because of the way he talked and the minor acts of sabotage they had been caught for before. Yeah, because criminals are stupid and they can't keep their mouths shut. <laughs> yeah, so this was definitely brought, brought in to drum up emotional impact to get mm-hmm. everyone on the oil, oil company side, right? Okay. <laughs> to get everybody on Big Oil's side. Yeah. The re- result of this un- of re- uh, undercover operation did link Lu- uh, Ludwig and Boonstra to the ongoing sabotage. Like, I don't think anyone disputes that. they The evidence did show that they were involved in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, including Ludwig, give- Ludwig gave the informant advice on how to bomb oil sites. Like, he was teaching this, this undercover oper- uh, officer how to do this. So, it's pretty clear. But it also brought the RCMP conduct into the spotlight, uh, which turned this whole case into a media circus. Yeah, of course. So, like, obviously, like, you know, a sting operation, like, so when the police are doing undercover operations, mm-hmm. they can do crime to maintain their cover. And that, I think that's, everyone kind of recognizes that, that, like, police doing petty crime while they're on, undercover so they don't blow their cover is, like, okay. Yeah, like, if a police, if a police officer was doing undercover work for, like, a theft ring or something and they like stole something i don't think people would be bothered by that because the understanding would be that they would be returning it yeah but the the thing is the police aren't supposed to like lead the crime mm-hmm. right the police aren't supposed to like cause the crime to happen yeah they're not supposed to be like hey what if we do this crime and it's even work because like say if if the police had gone to ludwig and given him like bombs and like coached him how to do it you could make an argument for entrapment yeah. I think this is even worse because they just blew up an oil site and everyone just assumed it was Ludwig, mm-hmm. right? So that that's th- this became like all over the news, you know, there's like hour by hour things. Uh, like I remember this, I was young at the time cuz th- this was it's coming out in 99 2000. So I was like 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even in the province yet. <laughs> yeah. So as I recall, he was mostly portrayed in the media as a dangerous cult leader. Of until, up until the moment the Dirty Tricks campaign was revealed. And then oh, the public of view of him became divided. Uh-huh. So this is where, like, if people don't remember, it, in this time, most media organizations weren't, like, right or left. They were kind of centrist, and they kind of only had barely a leaning one way or the other. Yeah. You could see it in this. Like, you could see, based on how they talked about Ludwig, where they stood on him. Like, yeah. just, even, even if they reported the facts, they would phrase things like, Calling him a terrorist or calling him or calling him an activist, it, like well, even just that that simple switch of terrorism and activism. Yeah. So this was pre nine eleven. These occurrences were pretty much unheard of in Alberta, and news didn't travel the way it did before. So like we weren't hearing about all the other shit happening in the world. Yeah. So this was news here because we had a terrorist in Alberta. So like this was everywhere for a couple of years. Almost immediately, several books were written. Of course. Like, and, you gotta capitalize wherever you can. Yeah, there were documentaries and TV movies started being produced. Uh, of course, due to all the media attention, Ludwig's family and property started getting a lot of unwanted attention. Because mm-hmm. height isn't hard to get to. Yeah. And eventually resulted in tragedy. So, on June 16th, 1999, around 4 a.m., two pickup trucks full of teenagers, mostly the children of oil and gas workers, trespassed on the grounds of the Ludwig compound and drove around. Allegedly, some of Ludwig's daughters were camping in a tent that was being circled by the trucks, and they said they feared for their lives. At some point in the night, three shots were fired from a rifle. 16-year-old Carmen Willis was hit and killed, and another teenage boy was hit but, but not seriously injured. During this time, Ludwig himself called 911 regarding the vehicles on the property, and noted that someone had shot the trucks. So he called 911, as you, as you would do, and said, hey, there's some trucks on my property, they might run people over. And then he made a comment like, like, and one of them is, has, has three bullets through it now. And the dispatcher asked him, did you shoot the truck? And he said, someone shot the truck. Mm, so, I don't like that. So shortly after that, the RCMP raided the property, located three rifles, which 
especially at this time, having rifles very common in this area. So, mm -hmm. and I don't think the firearms licensing had was in place quite yet. So, just having rifles that were unregistered was not a crime at this time. Yeah. Well, also, like it since they're in the middle of nowhere, it doesn't surprise me that they had rifles because if they were growing their own livestock, they would need like some way of protecting the livestock from yeah. like coyotes, wolves. Bears, cougars, like all kinds of stuff. Yeah, rifles super common out there at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, so they look at three rifles. They were not able to tie anyone to the shots fired. So they couldn't tie any of the rifles to the bullets. They couldn't find anyone who could actually witness to who shot it. Yeah, but like, that doesn't mean anything if everybody there is part of the family. Yeah, well, it's it it's it's dark. It's the middle of the night, so the teenagers in the truck didn't see anything. The family all all maintains that they don't know who did it. Like obviously they know who did it, but mm -hmm. like that. I don't believe for a goddamn moment that they don't know who did it. Are you kidding me? Yeah, so in the end, no one ended up being charged with this. And all the all the members of the compound maintained that they do not know who fired the shots. Mm -hmm. There was some sloppy reporting on this at the time. And, like, obviously a lot of people thought Ludwig himself did it. Quite a few people thought one of Ludwig's sons did it. Given that Ludwig made the phone call, I'm going to guess probably his sons did it. Because, like, this was still ongoing at the time that he was on the phone. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, like, I imagine that, like, you probably would have heard the gunshots if he was the one shooting. Well, yeah, because I imagine you're holding a gun in one hand and a phone in the other. That's yeah. That's pretty loud. Yeah, so, but, uh, it was, they kind of implied that, like, they didn't do it, but if they did do it, it was in self-defense. Uh-huh. So. Uh, in, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those things where, like, there, multiple things floating around. One was that they, like, they were trying to shoot at them, but not shoot them. Yeah. One was that they were trying to defend themselves because they were going to run over the kids. See, teenagers are stupid, but I don't think... I think that they would try to scare kids. I don't think that they would well, also intentionally another, harm them. There's also another possibility that they didn't know, didn't know the kids were there. That's true, because if it's dark and like you're in a tent in the middle of what is presumably nowhere, and you're not expecting people to be going around out there, like you probably don't have proper lighting and stuff. And some comments from some of the families involved suggested that maybe the teenagers were drunk at the time too, which mm. is not unreasonable to, to believe. Yeah, because it's a rural area. But we'll never find out because, like, none of the teenagers could see enough to witness it. Of course, none of the family's talking. Yeah. I, I imagine most of the family probably didn't even witness it. Like, it's yeah. probably just whoever did it just doesn't talk. This is, like, an aside, but do you think it's possible that one of the girls that was camping shot the teenagers no the girls who were camping were like were like nine ten like they were chill like small children so okay yep maybe like because it, it wouldn't be unheard of for a child that young to have a gun at the time i had access to some firearms when i was that age mm -hmm. but not likely i don't think especially if they're this religious based they might not even give yeah, guns to that's to true. girls i was thinking <laughs> yeah you know what actually i take that back i completely forgot about the whole Women need to be subservient. Of course they wouldn't give two girls a gun. Never mind. Yeah, so, like, then Ludwig did have several adult sons. Plus, again, the other families had adult male members that were around. Yeah. Could have been any of them, too. Yeah. But we'll never know, because it never there was never enough evidence to actually lay a charge. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of speculation that if it did go to court, the two big arguments would have been that either they didn't intend to hit anyone and there was warning shots, or that it was self-defense. But we'll never know. Mm -hmm. So... He was in the spotlight again because in 2008, several threatening letters followed by another string of bombings and vandalism began hitting oil sites in Dawson Creek area, uh, this time owned by Ancona. Uh, one company uh, offered $1 million reward for any information linked to the arrest of the bomber. Uh, Ludwig publicly spoke out against the bombings not long after, but also expressed sympathetic feelings. Yeah, like that just sounds like someone trying to cover their ass. <laughs> well, I will note that, that he was much less of a public figure at this time. Mm -hmm. After his conviction ended, he kind of stopped being in the spotlight and, and, and pulled back. So I'm actually inclined to believe that it wasn't him. But as you'll see, he definitely probably knew who was doing it. Yeah, I mean, it could be someone that he knows. It could be a copycat. But regardless, I do still think it sounds like somebody very very much trying to be like, wasn't me, guys. Yeah, Don't my, look at me. My tinfoil hat is it was one of his sons. Mm, because, I can see that. Yeah, RCMP forensics uh, found evidence of Ludwig's DNA on the letters. And so at the time of the DNA here, like this is why I think it's one of his sons. Mm -hmm. I think Ludwig himself is, was trying to stay out of the spotlight. He had been bitten and he was really just kind of like tucked his tail. 
but at the time, the way DNA sequencing worked, yeah, his sons probably would have shown up the same as him. Right. So that's why that's what that's what makes me think it's his son. Yeah, but even if it was like him, he like he could have just been coaching someone. Uh, they located books mostly on chemistry, but one was specifically on uh, on property destruction. Uh, they found potassium nitrate and marijuana, which was still legal at the time. Oh come on, you guys! Yeah. <laughs> so, so they they had reasonable explanations for all this actually. So the chemistry textbooks were there because they homeschooled their kids. Uh huh. So that's actually kind of reasonable. Uh, the book on property destruction apparently was a gift to him, which I'm willing to believe because that's the kind of circles he rolled in. I could see that being some kind of ironic wink, wink, nudge, nudge, like, hey, you know, this might be relevant to you. I mean, type no, he thing. practically wrote the book on property destruction. <laughs> uh, the pat- potassium nitrate, uh-huh. uh, he said, was for model rockets, which again was because of the science program they were running for their homeschooling. Did they have evidence that these experiments were being conducted, though? I don't know. That Like, the family never talked about it, and the RCMP was pretty tight-lipped about it. Um, I will say that, like, the previous bombings were all either with dynamite mm-hmm. or ammonium nitrate-based uh, explosives, yeah, which are more important than potassium nitrate. Yeah, because I don't think I asked what kind of bombs were being used. But if... They're different chemical compositions. I could see maybe the experiments being conducted because a lot of criminals don't really change their like modus operandi, but it's yeah. also not impossible to think, oh, I got caught because I used this, but if I use this chemical composition, they won't think it's me. Yeah, that's possible, but like... I personally kind of believe this narrative. I also think that like the family was was big enough, smart enough, had, had enough resources, and they did have friends in the community. They weren't complete pariahs. Mm. That if they were going to resume this operation, they probably wouldn't keep the shit where the police <laughs> will go find it. Okay, right? yeah. So uh, eventually he was released without charges. The investigation never really turned up anything new, and the bombing stopped after that. Which I think, like, I think also adds to the fact that it's probably his son or someone else from his compound. Yeah. Because... Like, at this time, I get the impression that Lovell was trying to stay out of the spotlight. So when it's, when these raids happened, he probably, like, smacked his kid up the head and was like, stop that. Like, you know. <laughs> You're going to get me arrested again. <laughs> yeah. You know, the few interviews he did give at the time, he said that, like, while he doesn't admit the, any def- that he was wrong or and he doesn't admit, admit any wrongdoing, he, doesn't admit he does it, he is going to focus on building his community rather than fighting the oil companies now. Mm-hmm. So, and I believe him because he never, like, he really stopped being super outspoken at this time. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention from earlier from his early activism was a fucking baller move he actually did before the terrorism started. Okay. Which, uh, he lives in, like, the Grand Prairie Grand, uh, area, and he was just in the municipality to, like, investigate the gas wells and see if they were infecting the water and stuff like that. And they ghosted him. They weren't responding to him at all. They weren't even just saying, like, no, it's safe. They just weren't answering. Well, yeah, of course. So one the, one day, the first time the first time he hit the news, he walked into the, I don't know which government building, it doesn't specify, but some government building in Grand Prairie. Okay. With a jar of sour crude he managed to obtain and dumped it on their carpet. <laughs> and it was like, you deal with it now. I mean, you know what? God damn it! That is pretty cool, actually. Cause, cause that, that's like don't <laughs> don't do that. That's an act. No. Of, that's an act of vandalism. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that. But also, like that's kind of badass. But, but as as a protest action, better than bombing things. Yeah, because well, like I could see somebody who tried to reach out, asked for like evidence of the thing, kept getting ghosted. I could see somebody being frustrated and forcing the government to take action. That's. Not saying I'm endorsing the actions being taken, but it conceptually, as an artist, it does sound pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And I will say, like, adding to, like, my belief that he stopped his terrorist activities and wasn't involved in the 2008 ones, for one, in Canada was a different company than the ones that were around his area. Mm-hmm. In Canada, is much more around the, the Dawson Creek area. Whereas AEC was the one that was mostly around his area, so they weren't directly related to his farm. Uh, he also, like like I said, was not in the public spotlight anymore, and he was pretty cordial at RCMP this time. So there's one act out where he, he even invited, apparently, a, a few RCMP officials to his house to, like, have dinner, and they went. 
and it was normal. Yeah, but that's not uncommon either that's not for unco- people to like keep police close to them. No, it's not uncommon either, but I think it is one of those things where like he had kind of given up the fight, and so mm-hmm. he was trying to be like, I give up. I'm not going to fight you on it. I can also see some weirdo in the middle of nowhere just being like, oh, hey, it's the cops. You want to have dinner? Yeah. I mean, he, he was pretty standoffish with the police before this point, so this was kind of a, a change. Like, he was never, like, in their faces or anything, but it was it was very much like, like, you better have some information if you want to be here kind of thing. <laughs> you know. <laughs> if you're going to come onto my property, you better have a warrant. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, in 2011, Ludwig was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. Oh. Yeah. He rejected the standard of care. Of course. Uh, instead, he treated himself by altern- alternative means. Of course. He also built his own coffin. So he... Okay. I, like, even though, like, yeah, alternative medicine, he definitely was, like, a weird, like, alternative person. But, like, I think he also consigned himself to the fact he was going to die. I mean, he was... He built he was, his own coffin. That's yeah. That is definitely um, someone who knows that... It's an inevitability and probably going to happen sooner than later. Yeah, so he shook his own coffin. He left instructions to his family, mostly for them to, like, keep the faith and not to bicker and all that, you know, stuff. Yeah, he's going to be with God or whatever. Yeah. He passed in April of 2012. And here's the last little bit of police misconduct. Oh, good. So at at the time uh, he passed, because the, the, obviously the family's prepared for him to die. He made his own fucking coffin. Yeah. So... Within a couple days of him passing, they had built a tomb for him on the property. He's entombed there. Uh, at the time, the RCMP contacted the family, requesting access to Ludwig's body to fingerprint him for some reason. I don't know why they would do this. Yeah. Like, for one, they would have his fingerprints from the first time he was in prison. Yeah, because they fingerprint you when you get in- indicted, don't they? Yeah, so yeah, if you, if you go to prison, hell, even if you're under a criminal investigation and you're being charged, you'll probably be fingerprinted. Yeah. So they have his fingerprints. And unless he like lo- like unless he burned his fingerprints off, like they they haven't changed. And even then, like he's dead. Yeah. So so they went to go fingerprint him for some reason. They he also obviously they have his fingerprints. He was not being charged with anything. Like he wasn't under an active investigation. Well, also he's dead. So like the most that they would be able to do is charge him posthumously. Yeah, well, they could at least close files if, if they true, could true. prove it. Yeah, but like, like when cold cases are closed. Like I get it, but I'm also just like, you're kind of wasting your time fingerprinting a dead guy. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and also like when you need access, like for police to have access by, this is something I have a little bit of experience with because I am a little bit involved in the death side of like people dying. Yes. So, <laughs> the death side of dying. Yeah, the, 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 well, the death side of the investigation. Yes, yeah, I understood what so, you meant. So, like, I've ever seen body transfers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, does the police sometimes do need to get access to a body to confirm their identity, which in this case is not really a case because they know who he is. Yeah, they know to, who he is. They went to his property to get his body to get his fingerprints. Yeah. Or if uh, if the death was suspicious in some way. Okay. So, like, if you die and... You die outside of a hospital, and it's not an expected death. Usually, the police want access to your body to confirm that you weren't murdered, right? But it was an expected yeah, death. This was an expected death, and also they don't fingerprint you. Like they do an autopsy. Yeah. So, because fingerprinting wouldn't help them. So the only thing I think that they are thinking is that somehow he faked his own death and like ran off. But like one, he wasn't currently being charged with anything, so there's no reason to. Yeah. Two, all his ties are here now. So what would he go to? And three, it's fucking 70. He's got cancer. Even if he did do that, he wouldn't last long. So Yeah, like, where's he going to go? So really, like, uh, my my tinfoil hat speculation is that they were trying to get something else. They were trying to find some reason to be on the Ludwig property again. Mm-hmm. Because fingerprinting Lebo himself doesn't really make sense. So, yeah, Ludwig, a controversial figure. And you can... I'm actually surprised that some of the some of the uh, articles I've re- written uh, I've read really lean one way or the other. Like it's very hard to find a neutral view on this guy. Mm-hmm. Even some like the the left wing like there's a there's a native owned publication that I got a lot of this information from. Yeah, they really left out a lot of the the bad stuff about Ludwig and really portrayed him as like an eco warrior kind of thing because you know it lines up with the current struggles with the oil field. Right. But I think that's that that undermines your point. I think if if you try to like sweep these like 
Ludwig was, in my opinion, not a good guy. He was a complicated guy. And it's acknowledged that, like, yeah, he was a legitimate activist and he had legitimate grievances, but he also was a bit of a terrorist, in my opinion. Yeah. I can see that. Because even though they targeted areas where people were likely not going to be, that doesn't mean that there weren't there weren't people there. Like, there's never a 100% guarantee that there isn't somebody that could be harmed by your actions. Especially when you're making explosives and you're intentionally trying to blow things up. Yeah. This is this one of those cases where it's like, it's like, it's like I respect his point, I don't respect his methods. Yeah. I mean, again, I can see someone being frustrated and being like, no one's listening to me. The government will help me. I'm going to take action into my own hands. Just look at a lot of like the oil field protests that are still happening yeah. where indigenous groups have been protesting pipelines being built on their land and they've been largely ignored or forcibly removed from their peaceful protests. Yeah, this, definitely, this definitely has like that kind of thing. Like It's a little bit different in this case because the fact that Ludwig was protesting stuff that was happening around him, whereas like a lot of indigenous tribes are protesting that's happening on their land, so mm-hmm. they should have say in and what's happening there? Yeah, I just do think it's interesting that like indigenous groups groups get like targeted with so much negative media for their peaceful protests, and then this one guy who may or may not have done this thing, but definitely did, um, <laughs> is is either a good guy or a bad guy. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's both. <laughs> He's both. He's, he's both. He's here to some terrorist others, but definitely both. <laughs> and that's it for this episode. I'm going, I have, of course, sources for this, which uh-huh. I will put into a Google Doc and I will link in the description of wherever I'm posting this. I don't know yet. I'm just going to shotgun a bunch of places. Yeah. But that'll be where you can find my sources for all this. And it'll be mostly like CBC News articles and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. Anything else you'd like to say before we close this episode? Um, don't blow things up. Yeah, that, yeah, don't blow things up. Uh, be kind to people, uh, but don't take shit. And also don't pour gas onto your local municipality office's uh, carpet. And if you're the police, don't do dirty tricks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>